Hello, and welcome to Aberone's Armorial. Today, we're going to be looking at the heraldry of Tolkien's worlds. And by that, of course, I mean the Elvish system of heraldry and the system of heraldries, or the systems of heraldry as used by the men of the West. So the most fleshed out system of heraldry in Middle-earth and in Beleriand in the first and second ages would, of course, be that of the houses the houses of Gondolin. Sorry about that. And this system would be used by all of the elves for out the history of Middle Earth. And as you can see, everything here is on a lozenge, which in normal Western heraldry would, of course, mean that those are the arms of a woman. However, in Tolkien's world, lozenges were for men, circles were for women. Squares were for impersonal or familial arms, and it seems that both the houses of an individual, their arms could be turned sideways to make it into a square and used by the whole house, which is kind of an interesting concept. It's not that alien to anything that we have done in Western heraldry, so there's that. They also had an interesting system of points, so if it was a star shape, it would have a number of points reaching the outer edge of the shield. So princes had four points, six to eight points for a king, and then a couple of them had 16 points for ancestors in the House of Finway, that sort of thing. So I'm going to be throwing around a lot of Lord of the Rings names and Cimmerillion names. If you're curious more about them, I would suggest just grabbing a copy of the Cimmerillion, the Hobbit, and the Lord of the Rings because they're all amazing. Uh, if you're interested about the House of Gondolin, read The Fall of Gondolin. Or if you don't want to read the best book series ever you can go check out men of the west here on youtube they're amazing they have so many great informative videos on these things so what you have before you are the arms of the 12 houses of gondolin and their leaders a couple of them are not actually named in the books or in the cimmerillion so the house of the pillar the house of the tower of snow the house of the tree and the house of the fountain none of which actually have a listed charge so this artist has taken creative liberty but these are all pretty similar to what has been described so i guess we will start with house of the king turgon was the king of gondolin and this is the arm his arms it had the moon and the sun and the scarlet heart and you can see this being alternated in inside of each other i've seen other ones where it was all three layered one on top of the other but this is another version of it, which I like. The House of the White Wing, which was, of course, the House of Tour. Sorry. I have to remember these things. I haven't, done, I haven't done some Tolkien reading in a while. You also have the House of the Mole, which was led by Maeglin, which is the only one to be a plain shield. It is plain black. Nothing else is listed. And then, of course, as you can guess, each one of these elements and emblems on the shield is based off of something that that house does in Gondolin. So beyond that, it's not all that creative. Well, it is creative, but it's not to the system of heraldry like we have today. It's very basic, but that's how heraldry started out. And Tolkien was a scholar of the early Middle Ages, so it makes sense that things are not overly complicated. It's for, for a reader or something like that. It makes more sense for it to be simplistic. Now, this, um, well, this system was used by others. We know that there are arms for Baron, Erendil, Haleth, uh, Beor, uh, Glorfindel, all these people that were friends of the elves and would have their own arms. But when people think of heraldry in Middle-earth, they're probably thinking more something along this. And this is, of course, the arms of Gondor. Now, this shield specifically is described in the books, and whoever the artist was took the inspiration, of course, from the from the movies, from the Peter Jackson films, which I think does a good job of showing off the banners and stuff. It makes it really come to life. But we're not here to talk about that. However, this is the shield that is more commonly used in the Second Age because it is used by the kings of the United Kingdom of Arnor and Gondor. You see the seven stars, you see the white tree, you see the crown. Now, these all have different meanings, of course. So the tree, if anybody knows their Tolkien legendarium, 
you'll know that the tree is a sapling that was brought to Middle Earth from Numenor by Isildur. Yes, the same Isildur. And it was a cut of the, of the tree Nimloth, which was in the court of the High King in Armenelos. There was also the series of stars. You have the crown. And there's two alterations to this. There's kind of some conflicting writings on it. Um, this is the also uh, usually referred to as the arms of both An Arnor and Gondor. However, there was a different version of the arms of Gondor that was used that just showed the tree without the crown. And that was used in the time until the line of kings died out, which is kind of interesting. It's a period that's not always covered. Um, it's mentioned in Tolkien's writings, but nobody ever thinks about it. And actually, if you watch the Lord of the Rings movie, there is a banner of it where it shows the tree more rounded out instead of outwards, like how it is on the screen here. Um, so there's so some people will usually associate this with Arnor and the other one with Gondor. And then it's kind of back and forth. Peter Jackson, I think, did a little interesting twist on it too because uh, I'll get to that in a minute because the stewards. But these arms, these are the arms of Gondor or the king of Gondor at least. And we know that they're not just the arms of Gondor because we know there are other arms and emblems representing other parts of Gondor. So of course, here's a very nice painting that I really enjoy, which shows Aragorn and the rest of them riding off um, from the Corsair ships, getting ready to enter the Battle of Pelennor Fields. And there is the banner of the king there. You also see it in the movies where Aragorn is wearing it as a surcoat over his chainmail, which I think looks awesome because how can you not think that's awesome? Now, now probably people are wondering why there's a plain white shield. Well, when the line of kings died out and the, and the stewards took over, everybody knows the story. If you don't, again, crack the book. It's worth it. Um, when the stewards took over, their emblem was just a plain white shield. That's all that's described. It's not really talked about anything else. It also mentions that their banners were just plain white banners with nothing on them, which is odd. I can see it. It's, you know, it's showing the absence of the king. But if you think about it, they use that for a, a, near a thousand years, so it doesn't really make any sense to me. But in the movies, Peter Jackson did this, which I thought was really good. It's a play off the traditional Gondor banner. It's just a white flag with the tree. I think that looks good. I think that's a little better than what Tolkien described. I know it's probably a sin to say it. However, it makes sense. And the only time you see this banner is in the flashback flashback work showing Boromir taking over Osgiliath again and this is the banner that they plant now of other heraldic emblems in the realm of Gondor the most common would probably be this which is the emblem or the shield used by Imrahil the prince of Dol Amroth which is for I'm guessing the entire fiefdom of Dol Amroth there's some writings on the emblems of the other fiefdoms of Gondor. However, they're very vague and indescriptive, and I couldn't even generate shields for them. So I didn't really want to cover them. Men of the West has a great video about it, and I will link it in the description. But, you know, these are the common things, and everybody knows of Imrahil and the Swan Knights. Of course, there he is with his wings. And which I was really sad because Imrahil really didn't make any appearance in the movie and Imrahil and the Swan Knights are amazing and awesome. If you ever read the books, it's totally like the best part of the Battle of Pelennor Fields. And then of course, everybody knows this, it's the White Horse of Rohan. Now, I didn't realize this until literally yesterday because I'm colorblind, but whenever I've always watched the movies, I thought the banner that rips off of the flagpole in front of Edoras was actually red and not green. I'm colorblind, I apologize. but. The emblem of Rohan is a white horse on a green field. And you can see this, of course, being used in banners. If you look at the artwork of it, it makes sense. It's very, very Anglo-Saxon as well. Um, very similar to the banners of some of the kingdoms of Anglo-Saxon England. Um, if you know, that was Tolkien's main area of study. And he loved the Rohirrim. It was kind of like his pet child because it's, oh, it's Anglo-Saxon stuff thrown into my world. Now, there are some variations of this banner. This is, of course, the throne room in Edoras in the Great Hall. 
and you have all these banners. There's five of them. I think if you look out even further, there's two on the left and right walls that aren't really seen here. Uh, all of them are banners of Rohan. You only see the variations here, though, which I think is interesting. There is some debate because it could be a banner for each one of the marks of Rohan, which is kind of like their version of fiefdoms or provinces or, you know, baronies, whatever you want to call them. But there is also another debate saying that, well, one's the banner of the king and one's the banner of this house and the other one. So there's some debate, but those are the banners of Rohan, all of which are pretty similar. I think they're the best because they're arguably some of the more heraldic emblems and I think they look cool. Well, this is where I'm going to end this video for the day. I hope you enjoyed my little bit of a rambling today. I will be making more videos on fantasy heraldry soon. I think that's important because if that's what gets people into actual heraldry, it's a useful tool. So if you liked this video, please remember to like and subscribe. I apologize if I've made any factual errors with the Tolkien Legendarium. Like I said, it's been a while since I've read some of these. And if you have any questions, please feel free to like and comment and please subscribe. Have a great day. Thank you.